All right, so uh, officially we're here with with Ed O'Connor, uh, part two uh, with VIP. You're you're starting to become a regular guest on this show. How does that uh, How does that feel? Oh, that means we're either with the the number one uh, show in harness racing or, or darn close to it, right? We work for the best, so it's got to be good. How did your life change after the first uh, interview podcast we did? Because I'm sure I'm sure there was many many changes in your life. <laughs> Well, well, I think after after um, the stable guys and I had our, our mixed martial arts uh, fight that, that you uh, spurred on from our discussion, uh, everything has kind of settled down after that. You know, he, he, he took me to the mat and uh, beat me pretty good, but other than that, everything is fine. Well, good, good. I'm I'm glad VIP is <laughs> back to back to normal, right? Back to making money and back to doing business as well. <laughs> yeah, everything's been pretty good. Uh, yeah, after we spoke last year, we we really had a. a tremendous year uh not everything in life goes well all at the same time usually but that is kind of what happened last year we had two-year-olds race well three-year-olds race well older horses race well was a banner year for us uh as far as wins we went to some of the premier events as you know uh, our keystone velocity a horse that we have with renee allard ended up winning the older uh horse of the older pacing horse of the year um from the Harness Riders Association, that was a, a pretty special evening. So, uh, all the way around, we were really clicking on all cylinders, and, and you know, trying to repeat after a year like that can be a, a bit of a challenge. But we're we think we're up for the uh, we're up to try. We've got some great prospects. We've got a lot of the real nice ones back uh, from last year. So we're, we've got our fingers crossed that 2018 is going to be at least as good, and, and if we get a little lucky, maybe better. Yeah, I, I think uh, we're not here to talk about the past, right? Because that's nah. in the past. You you got to look towards the future. I think what's kind of interesting though is you guys are uh, you guys are the biggest fractional ownership. So what's the official title on that? What what's the, what do you guys call yourselves? We just call ourselves a partnership group. You know, there's yeah, I guess depending on how it's structured, you fractional ownership, partnership, syndicate. There's a lot of people call it different things. But we just call it partners. You know, we look at our the guys we work with, the guys and gals who who invest their money with us as as, as our partners. We work together to try to make this thing successful. And you know, if it all goes well, everybody's happy at the end of the day. And you guys are the biggest, right? Most money, most wins, most all that. Oh, every category you can check off, you're the biggest, right? Every category we seem to be the biggest, uh, except the number of horses purchased. You know the. Uh, a couple other folks who I think ended up buying more two-year-olds over the last couple of years, but we, we still ended up uh, with uh, results that we feel really proud of. Um, so yeah, we, we are the biggest and the best. We'll, we're, we'll, we will gladly uh, have a little braggadociousness and, and say that. <laughs> uh, so what, one of the things that I find interesting is uh, that you guys – or because listen, when you're that big, you can't just focus on one area. So you have to start going to every division of horse, two year olds, three year olds, older horses, and then you have to start spreading out to different states, different racetracks, different areas. So you guys have to venture out into different, you know, uh, into that area, different trainers, different tracks. So uh, do you want to give a quick? You, you don't. I mean, how many? You don't have to tell the trainers if you don't want to, or the partners. How many? Horses, how many trainers, how many racetracks, how many states? Because part of, I think part of the allure of this partnership is that you could be anywhere and probably find a horse or some horse to jump into that's relatively close to where you live. Yeah, that, that's kind of always been the goal. Um, I, I was talking with the, one of our members uh, a week or two ago, and then about how the how we enjoy winning a, a four thousand claimer at Rosecroft just as much as we enjoy winning uh, the Levy. Well, maybe not quite as much, but it's still pretty darn thrilling. And and for our partners, your horse coming down the stretch in front, regardless of what you're racing for, is is just one of the most exciting things there is. So, yeah, we've we've used that kind of energy to spread where we're racing. Yeah, we don't race in California, Cal Expo. We haven't really raced at Pompano, but other than that, we East Coast, Midwest. We've raced in Canada. Uh, we probably have about six or eight guys training for us now. We feel really good with the folks we work with. We've got a, a little over 60 horses in training right now, and that fluctuates, you know, week to week, day to day. We 
lost a couple of claims last week. We, we didn't get the claims we were looking for. So that, that number is always moving. And, uh, again, we, we try to be really focused on the, our partners we work with. So, you know, if folks are looking for something to race at Buffalo or something to, to race at the Meadowlands, you know, if, if, odds are pretty good that we're able to put together some type of deal to buy a horse that's, you know, interesting to watch, fun, get to the winner's circle type that uh, everybody's going to enjoy. So, you know, we, we really try to go where our folks want us to race. And, and um, you know, it's, it's just going out there and racing and winning is, is the best advertising we can get. So the more that we do, the better off we feel about it. Is this year one of the more focused years on some on purchasing yearlings and two-year-olds so that to, to develop your own – instead of buying, you know, when they're already at their peak – you're buying them, developing them, and hopefully have them for a long time. Yeah, this is the the biggest yearling crop we've ever had, we've, we, and we've had uh, you know a lot of success over the last six, eight, ten years. Uh, we've had Breeders' Crown entries. We've had you know we had a, a yearling purchase from a couple of years ago in the Hamiltonian last year. Uh, but with that being said, you know this was the the biggest crop we've ever had. We we got horses in New York, Pennsylvania primarily, but the Midwest, Ohio, Indiana. Uh, we've got a couple Ontario breads. Uh, we've got them with uh, six different trainers kind of spaced all over. Some are in Florida training. Uh, as, as you talked about, having to kind of go across different divisions. You know, we, we've always had a lot of pacing colds and some trotting colds. We've got pacing fillies. We've got trotting fillies. We've got a little bit of everything in hopes of just finding the, you know, the, the best horse. And, and we went into the sales not for looking for a particular sire, a particular this or that. It's kind of like uh, they talk about it, the, you know, the baseball or the basketball draft. You know, we, we took the best player available in every case. We think we paid the right amount. Um, and, and we're pretty happy so far. You know, for the most part, everybody is doing really well. And, and this is the time of the year where things start to get exciting. They start to go a little bit more speed. You can kind of get a sense of the gait is good, the attitude is good. And now we've only got, you know, three three more months to, to see if uh, it's going to start paying off for us. So it's, it, it's we're kind of caught in the middle, but it's, a, it's certainly an exciting time. Now, I'll just point out Keystone because obviously one older pace of the year. But So you guys purchased him a couple of years ago, right? Yeah. So uh, the fall of 2016. Right now, I, I would imagine you know I don't care about the actual money uh, purchased on it, but it, you know it was it was a quitty, it was it was a pretty big check. Uh, whether you know I don't care about the percentages of partnerships or any of that. Tell me about the difference between now Key, Keystone. I know he had a year off, but it was still a relatively I don't want to say safe, but you know what you were getting with the investment. Is that fair to say? Mm-hmm. Absolutely, and, and that's the case when you, you go to these uh, racehorse auctions. You buy things that have a past performance line. You buy yearlings, and you you're just really taking a guess. So talk, um, talk that's that part, that's yeah, that's what I want to get into. Tell me about uh, did you go to the sales this year? And tell me about maybe one or two horses. And again, I don't care about the names uh, unless you want to mm-hmm. or the purchase price. But what what were some of the ones that that you were like, ugh? I don't really want to write this check, but I know <laughs> that I have to because, you know, sometimes you got to take a big swing to hit a home run, right? You absolutely do. Um, yeah, the idea of going out and buying yearlings, it's just a lot more risky. And, and we've been in the yearling game for a number of years. And we've, again, we've done, we've done really well and we've been uh, really happy with the results we've been able to bring to our partners, but we, we took a little bit of a different uh, tact at it this year. Instead of buying you know, bigger shares or, uh, of horses or you know, buying you know, a dozen horses on our own, we tried to spread the money around a little bit and buy a little bit smaller percentages of a lot more horses with the idea that you know, our partners uh, tend to like to spread their money around, and, and we really suggest that guys go in the yearling game, they should diversify. You know, it, you're going to have a way better chance of, of having a, a good horse and maybe a great horse if you buy uh, 10% of five horses than if you buy half of one horse on your own. It, it's really just a numbers game. You, you don't have those past performances in front of you like a, a Keystone Velocity or some of these horses we buy at a public auction to go back and look at. Um, you know, you, you don't know how physically talented they are. You don't know what their attitude's going to be. You don't know how sound they're going to be. Um, but the upside of going about it this way is, you know, you, you can end up buying a horse, 
uh, uh, Keystone Philosophy is a great example. Um, you know, we bought him t- um, in the middle part of his career when, when we know he was a great horse, but the people who bought him as a yearling paid $3,000. Yeah, a horse has made a million and a half or more for for a horse that sold as a yearling at three thousand dollars. Well, clearly there's a lot of unknowns going into that, but that's a pretty good return on investment. Anyway, you you, you look at it, so you, you you can really get lucky in the yearling game, and and we try to get folks uh, who who work with us to not go in on one yearling, go in on four or five, and and you know, Going to the sales this year, we, we had a number of different ones that we really liked. We started at the Goshen sale early in the year, um, and we bought a trotter there that uh, my partner Tom James was just in love with. Um, tr- trainer Paul Kelly ended up actually signing the ticket, and as soon as I found out that that was the case, I, I called up Paul and asked him if we could be involved. You know, we, we didn't get him. Uh, we weren't able to buy him ourselves, but Paul got him, so, but we bought in on him. And, and uh, you know, the Colts doing really well. Uh, Ryan, I know you were uh, down talking to Paul about him over the winter, and you know our plans are uh, to give him a uh, a little bit of a moderate two-year-old year, and then really look for big things. He, he's doing well so far, and maybe you know moderately plays cold. And we've got a couple stories like that uh, with horses with Renee Alar, with John Bootenshane, with Brian Brown. You know, ones that you go and you look at and you, you think are the right horse, and uh, you just have to hope and pray at, at that point. You know, we let these trainers do their thing, and, and hopefully they're uh, going to come north with horses that are going to really be exciting for us. So that's kind of how the yearling game works for us. That's uh, <laughs> hope and pray at this point. Now, I, I've been around hundreds of yearlings, and it's fun as a trainer to watch every day them develop and you're teaching them something every day and you you know you it's a blur from october to june uh but that's as a trainer and you don't really see the like you don't really feel the blur because it's just your work and you're teaching as an owner mm-hmm. other than these fantastic videos produced by trotcast hint hint uh <laughs> uh how do you guys as an owner like you know this is like god i want to can we get to June already? Like, like you said, now this is the exciting time. So, how do you, how do you, how do you personally handle it, and how do you help your partners deal with uh, the stress of not being able to? God, I want to watch this horse. Or is the solution, hey, we got racehorses too, and that'll kind of distract you until the two-year-olds race? It, it's it's really hard uh, being an owner of a, a yearling and now a two-year-old in that. You're, you, you put up a lot of your money, you know, you've got bills every month, but you really don't have the ability to be there every day. And most owners aren't there every day. Some are lucky enough to you know, go in and check in on a regular basis. And so what ends up happening is you know, we're talking to the trainers all the time. How are they doing? How are they doing? But that's kind of like you know, grandma and grandpa calling up and you know, asking mom or dad, well, well, how's the baby doing? Well, you know, the baby did a million things today, and I was with him all day, and we're, you know, he's doing this or that, but, you know, except for the big milestones, you know, took his first step, rolled over for the first time. You know, we as owners don't hear about a lot of the day-to-day stuff that you trainers are doing. So, uh, you know, we, we get training time, you know, the horse has been in 245, been in 230, been in 220, good gated. So, the, the information is, is kind of few and far between, and, and up until about this time of the year, we treat it as, you know, no news is good news because, um, you know, the trainers are going to call us if the horse has a problem or if the horse gets hurt. So as, as long as they're training along and we don't hear a lot, that's fine. Now we're at the point of the year where we start to, you know, understand, well, they're going in 218, they're going in 220, he's good gated, you know, the, the horses are starting to separate into the A groups and the B groups and the, you know, the ones who aren't quite as good type group. So uh, now is where the information starts to come in, and we're really constantly talking to our, our partners on, um, you know, we, we know you want more information, we know there's, you know, there, there's just, it, at this point, it, it, it's not, there's not a lot to tell. The videos are really, really great, um, and, and you, thank you again, those, those are, uh, it couldn't be more helpful to just to see what the horses are doing, you know, the, the day-to-day stuff that they do, the training, the, the the jogging, um, you know, all the stuff that the trainers do, a lot of times people who don't go to the farms don't get to see. So um, if more 
Barnes did that, I think it would really help this uh, section of, of harness racing, the yearling game, and that uh, you know, being involved, being uh, you know, having to be able to see what's going on all the time is is so useful. Um, you know, here in a little bit, they'll, the horses will start coming north. They'll start training faster. Then they'll be qualifying. You know, we're getting more information, but the, but the videos and pictures that the trainers are sending—that's that's how a lot of our guys are. We're able to connect them with with what's going on, and it, it's it's tremendously helpful. I know you were uh, somewhere between joking and, and putting in a shameless plug, but but that that's really valuable. And you know, whether it's you guys or some some other folks or people taking out their iPhone, it's it's just the kind of information um, that really gets people you know keeps them connected with what's going on, and I think it's great. Yeah, I think that was our biggest uh, goal was just to connect people. And you know, listen, it's great to see a, a five second video of a horse finishing a mile, but I also found when I was shooting the videos that there again maybe there's a lot of little things you don't exactly notice that you're trying to teach your yearling, and it's like one of the things was. Hey, if you're in a group and the horse, you know, maybe one horse is a little shy of a whip and you watch him go around and by the end of that mile, he's not shy of the whip because he learned uh, that, hey, you know, that whip isn't going to jump up and bite me if it's in my face, you know, or, or things like that. So uh -huh. hopefully the videos uh -huh. provided a little bit more than just, hey, how's the gate? Because I think a lot of the attitude of these horses is what ends up making it. There's, listen, there's plenty of fast horses out there, but the ones that turn into champions, they're, they're, they do a little bit things a little bit differently than the other ones. So hopefully uh, in the videos you can kind of watch them, slow motion, whatever, and, and see, how they, uh, see how they react. Watch their ears flicker, you know, things like that that always uh, excited me while I was actually recording the videos. Is there anything last that you want to, uh, you know, because now's the exciting time. So uh, in June, you know, do you like the, the do you like the two year olds better than some of the three year olds, or you just like anything that is is going to win? Uh, well, it's, it, 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 to some degree, like picking between your children. You know, I, any of our horses that, that our partners are doing well with, we are and are getting us to the winner's circle. We like, but there's there's something really exciting and special about owning a younger horse. You, you see him develop. You know, you go out. Uh, yeah, I was just kind of uh, reminiscing this past weekend about you know, a couple crops ago. We we had uh, some nice horses like All Star Partner and Duel in the Sun. You know, we, the, you know, we thought they were good all along. We you know, we weren't sure, and we you know, we go out on the the initial race for both of them. They they win a stakes race at the Meadowlands both on the same night. And I'm kind of thinking about, well, can we have a class that's you know that good? And then these horses go on and make you know five, six, seven hundred thousand dollars each. Um, yeah, you know, I'm. I'm. Hoping that's the reason you get into the two-year-olds to have that hope. You know, is this a good horse? Okay, they won their first race. How good are they going to be? Uh, we had a horse win at the Meadowlands last weekend. He, he won his first race as a two-year-old, and then had a really minor injury, and, and we put him away for the year. So he won him once as a two-year-old. Now he's won once at three. And, and, and I'm looking at the entries just this morning and saying, you know, is this a really good horse? Can you know? He's two for two. Can he be three for three and then four for four and so on? Or is, you know, is he just going to kind of be whatever? And, and that's the real part that um, people who don't get into the yearling game, you, you, they don't get a chance to do. You, I mean, you have a 20 claimer. Yeah, he might be a 30 claimer if he gets good, but he's not going to win the horse of the year. You know, these, these younger ones who are just developing, you just don't know how good they're going to be. And, and that's a really exciting feeling. You know, it's a little disappointing when uh, you, you enter a mistakes race and you hope they're going to do well and, and they don't move forward or they, they, you know, something goes wrong. That's, that's the game we're in. Bad stuff happens all the time. Uh, but every once in a while, thing, your plan goes right and the horse shows up and the trainer has him in the perfect spot. And, and, and that's when, you know, you win these big races and, and, it gets just so exciting. That's it, 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 too bad this isn't a video call because you know, I'm, I'm kind of smiling talking about <laughs> it because that's real. That's the real excitement in these things is, is um, you know following these horses, watching them develop, having them do well. Uh, there, there's nothing more thrilling than you know ha having been part of the team this whole time and then you know have it come together. Uh, you, you, you always have guys in the winter circle, guys and gals in the winter circle after you, you know you win a that that four claimer at Rosecroft I was talking about. And yeah, it's great. It's fun. 
but it's not like winning the Hamiltonian. It's not like winning the Little Brown Jug. I mean, heck, it's not like winning a sire stakes for the you know horse that you bred or horse that you bought as a yearling. You know, that's where you're like, oh my God, we we did this. We you know, we started from here and we made it to here, and the trainer helped us. And you're 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 falling all over yourself thanking the trainer because they've gotten you to this point. That that's the real fun of this game, and that that's why people need to be involved in these younger horses. It's a, it's a way to get in at a much lower cost. Uh, yeah, you, you're kind of paying bills. We look at it as kind of the installment payments uh, to, to buying into a horse over time. But uh, the excitement that you get out of these, these babies just can't be repeated with the, the older horses. All right, last question, and I'm going to put some pressure on you here, right? Five, here, mm-hmm. Here's – and, and I'll, I'll give – my five-year summary plan for VIP includes uh, Hamiltonian win, uh, a couple of Breeders' Crowns, I don't know, maybe Meadowlands Pace will sprinkle in there. Uh, and I don't know, maybe like a low level stakes, like the, like the audio, something like that. Uh, okay. right. That includes the five-year plan, but does the five-year plan also include buying some horses in Europe? Uh, I would love to buy some horses in Europe. Well, I, well uh, we actually toyed with the idea of uh, racing some horses in Ireland uh, as, as kind of a fledgling market as a way to dip our toe in. Um, racing horses in, uh, in, in on the continent, France or in uh, Sweden, Finland, something like that, where you know it's all trotters and, and they're as good as they are anywhere around the world. That would be outstanding. I would love that. So you, I think I think you, we just have to put that on our bucket list, Ryan. That would be perfect. Well, I know a couple guys over there, so I, I, I just, you know, it's, it's always, it's interesting. Like I talk to other people in other countries, and you don't realize some of the simple rules. Not even horse wise. I'm talking tech wise and things like that. You're like, oh, you can't do that over there, or oh, we can't do that over here. So I'm wondering yeah. if, you know, I mean, since there's a partnership, I wonder how that, how the rules are in England and Sweden, and if they understand how powerful it is in America and North, you know, North America, and, and hopefully. Because I, I think the only way we truly survive is globally. So we got to get some VIP horses over in uh, over in France and Sweden and Finland and Australia and New Zealand. So um, that's yeah. So I, I think that's what we got to do. You agree? I like it. This is a plan. Yeah. This, uh, give, it, give, I, I, I'll get my passport renewed. We'll get a bunch of stamps on there going around talking to people. And, and I like it. Bada bing. So uh, a, a, anything – give your shameless self-promotion, Ed. All the VIP stuff. Uh, tell them how they can contact you and and what you know what the initial process is like. Uh, that's easy. It's uh, contacting us. We try to make it as simple as possible with vipstable.com. Uh, it's eight seven seven VIP win one is the phone number. Uh, Ed at vipstable.com to you know get right to me. So that, that's how they do it. We make getting in pretty easy. We. we if someone contacts us, we let them know what's currently available, costs. We talk to them about the ongoing monthly cost to race different horses, where they want to uh, actually invest. Do they want to, you know, if they're in New Jersey, they want a horse to race in New Jersey so they can go see them every week, or they want a horse that is the best possible, that they're fine watching them on their computer or at a simulcast location. Uh, so we kind of talk to folks and see, you know, what they're, uh, what they're really looking for, and we try to match it all up if, if they like how we operate and, and the prices are right hopefully we can uh, get them involved but we like to be upfront with people and you know some people just aren't ready for this type of stuff we'd, we'd rather have a long conversation and, and uh, uh, exceed their expectations in the long term than to you know, give a little fast talk up front we, it, it just doesn't work out that way so we try to make it easy uh, it's uh, we've been around for a long time with the biggest and the best for a reason so there you go the boom mic drop Ed with the mic drop. We're the best and the biggest for real. I like that. That that should be on your shirt. I listen. I I like listen. The cockiness attitude. You, listen, you, you got to have a little bit of it. You know, you, you can't be the best and the biggest without a little bit of saying, yeah, we're the best. We're we're gonna we're coming for you. We're <laughs> right. Yeah, we we. Uh, <laughs> what, what fun is what fun is it if you uh, you can't brag a little bit, right? Yeah, I mean, you you guys have, you know win some awards and have a little fun with it. I, I think uh, I think that's the, that that's what it comes down to in the end: fun, thrill, enjoyment, excitement. Like, yeah, what if you win a big race? Well, like, why wouldn't you want to go and celebrate it? So, 
Absolutely. That, that's the fun of the game. There, there's enough bad stuff that happens. Horses get hurt. Horses get sick. Horses don't turn out as well as you want. So when, when something goes right, you know, smile and, and you know, give your buddy a little crap about it. Yeah, that's the fun stuff. Yeah, absolutely. You really need to enjoy it when you can. So uh, uh, pleasure again, Ed. Hopefully uh, you don't get too, uh, too much celebrity after this second vi- uh, podcast. But if it does happen, I mean, listen, you got to deal with it. It's part of being celebrity uh, and part of being on, on a world-famous podcast like Trodcast. So it is what it is, right? you got to deal with it. it. It is what it is. If I need to, to hire some muscle, I'll give you a call. No problem. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've, I, I've been, uh, been bench—I I could bench press like 125 now. So I'm really uh, getting my swole on lately. Sounds good. <laughs> All right, thanks. Thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Ed.